Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany Prather. I'm a registered nurse and program coordinator for the Louisiana Clinical and Translational Science Center, or LACAT Center for short, like we call it. Um, I work directly with the center director, and I help carry out the day-to-day -day administrative duties for the LACAT Center grant. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the National Institute of Health, or NIH for short, um, their guidelines and templates, uh, but specifically as it pertains to pilot grants that are a part of the Community Scholars Program. The agenda um, for today is um, we're going to talk about, we're going to take a look at the NIH checklist and general templates, uh, specifically the NIH form pages one through three, and uh, the, the forms required for human sections protection. The learning objectives, objectives today, uh, identify and find the most updated NIH forms. Um, you should be able to complete the NIH forms one through three and complete all the components of the PHS human subjects and protection form. And then lastly, you should identify the process and timeline to submit and approve your forms at your particular institution. Um, just to note, uh, today I will specifically uh, be talking about the requirements for NRH for pilot projects funded under the LACAT Center Federal Grant. If you're submitting other grants to NIH, um, the, just know the process and the form requirements might be different. So this is specifically for our program as mandated by NIH as of today. Um, first and foremost, if you know you're going to be submitting a pilot project or any grant really, you should notify your grants office as soon as possible. Um, there may be particular internal deadlines or internal processes that you have to follow within your institution. And also, the, they do need to sign off on the grant. So they, need, they do need to know in the beginning that this grant is coming up and the timeline for that. So what forms are required for pilot grants um, under the LACAT Center? This is a snapshot of them. Um, we do provide our pilot investigators with a checklist of what is needed for NIH approval. So that'll kind of help you have a one page overview of the forms that are needed. Um, as of today, these are the forms that are uh, needed for NIH approval. Um, NIH has changed this a little over the years, but as of today, the, this is the requirement, requirement for us to submit for approval of your pilot project. Um, there is a form page one, which is your face page or a cover page. This is the particular page that um, that your institutional representative or grants office has to sign off on. Um, there's a form page two, which is the project summary and uh, project sites you're conducting research at. There's a form page three, which is the key personnel and significant contributors. There's a biographical sketch. And last but not least, there is a particular form for human subjects protection called the PHS Human Subjects and Clinical Trials Information Form, and it also includes, includes the Inclusion Enrollment Report. We'll be talking about each of these in a little more detail. And as you see at the top, there is a link provided. On your checklist, There, this link will also be listed there. Uh, we provide the link to because we really want you to take these templates directly from the NIH site. These forms are updated periodically, and we may not we may not know that at the time. And NIH does require for you to use the most up to date templates. So when you go to to get these, when you go to fill out these forms, just go directly to the NIH site and uh, download these forms from there. And I will show you a snapshot of what the web page looks like coming up. So this is a quick overview of human subjects and vertebrate animals research. Um, uh, this is kind of an add-on uh, from what Leela Monica's presentation earlier in the webinar series was on, where she talked about human subjects protection and the importance of addressing this as part of your proposal. So human subjects, uh, it does require IRB approval. 
it does, you do have to address the six points specified on pages 22 to 23 of the NIH instructions. And I'll show you where those instructions are um, on the next slide. Um, it assures reviewers that human subject experiments are necessary, well thought out, and scientifically sound, and indicates how many patients per year will be available. But vertebrate animals research, which, which for the Community Scholars Program and the projects pertaining to that, usually don't have a vertebrate animals component. But um, if they do, or you submit another project with vertebrate animals research, just know that there is a separate section that is a little bit different than the human subjects. So vertebrate animals, um, if you have vertebrate animals as part of your research, it requires what's called IACUC approval. It's different and separate from IRB. Um, it addresses the five points specif specified on page 23 of the NIH instructions. And it assures that the animal experiments are necessary, well thought, and scientifically sound. So this is a snapshot of the PHS 398 webpage where all of the templates we're gonna talk about are located. Um, the uh, downloadable instructions are very important, especially if you're not familiar with the forms. So when you go to this page, I recommend first you downloading the instructions. NIH does a great job of going step by step for each of these forms on what's required. So I can't stress that stress this enough to really have the, um, the instructions available to you when you're going through these forms. So the first form we're gonna take a look at is the face page or form page one. Um, this is the form that needs to be routed for signatures um, by your authorized signing official at the academic PIs institution. This is important. The community scholars, organ the community PIs organization cannot sign off on this form. It has to be uh, the academic PIs institution. So at Pennington, for example, our chief operating officer is the authorized signing official. Um, and then there's someone designated in our grants office, usually our grants office director that can also sign off on this form. Um, if you're not familiar, you haven't done one of these forms again, I really recommend you when you um, contact your grants office and let them know you're submitting, that talks to them about this form. A lot of times um, they will complete this form for you or the second half of this form at, in, at, in, uh, at the least. So, um, but it's a pretty self-explanatory form, I will say. Um, for this particular program, um, there is, a, the grant number is not required here. All of our pilot projects under the LACAT Center fall under our main grant number. So your grant will not have a specific number with NIH. So the grants number is not required um, as of now for this program, but everything else on this form um, should be um, completed or addressed. So it's basically information on you as the academic PI, your contact information. Um, you're gonna check off here if your uh, project is human subjects research, if you have any research exemptions, if you're going to be doing vertebrate animals research, that will be all checked off and addressed here, as well as your budget and um, budget period. And then the bottom half is really the information for your authorized signing official. It's you know who to notify if a grant award is made, and then who actually is a signing official, their contact information, and of course, at the bottom, their signature. But like I said, if you've never filled out this form before, um, I would contact your grant office initially and get them to help you with this form. I will say the most common mistake I see with this form is the human subjects research part not filled out correctly. It really needs to match what your IRB approval says. So uh, just make sure that if your project is human, re human subjects research, which I believe most of these projects under um, the Community Scholars Program are that it's checked yes. And if you have any research exemptions, that it's checked here and the appropriate exemption is listed. 
Um, the second page for uh, the face page is if you have a multi PI grant. Um, for the community scholars program, I know there's two PIs that are required. There is the academic and then the community. So the community PI's information would go on uh, the second page of the form page. And if you have any other PIs uh, that are involved in this project, their information would go on to the second page. If you don't have a if you don't have a second PI and it is a sole PI project, then the first page is only required. This is just a quick example of an actual face page that was approved by NIH and just a snapshot of what that would look, look like. Okay. Moving on to the pay, forum page two, the summer, summary relevance and project performance site page. Um, this, this particular page, if you follow the NIH instructions, they have specific guidelines and character limits for these sections, especially the some project summary, summary and irrelevant. So just make sure that you're aware of that. Um, under the project summary, is usually just a short abstract of your project. The relevance is usually the public health relevance of your project. Both of these, like I said, um, have character limits. So just make sure you're staying within the character limits. And those are in the NIH instructions. The bottom half of this is the performance sites. This is, these are the sites, locations, clinics, organizations where the research is taking place at. So you would list those in those organizations there. Okay, going back to the web page where you can find all these templates. Um, we're going to, I think we're going to move on to human subjects part of um, your proposal, the clinical human subjects and clinical trials information form. Um, that is found here. Um, and as you see, there is a PDF that can be downloaded. There's not a Word version of this, of this available. The important thing about this form initially is that you download the form to your computer Sometimes just by clicking the form, you may get an error message, but if you download the form to your computer, you should be able to see it. Um, if you have trouble with this part of um, this part of the process or this form or template, just contact the Community Scholars Program and um, get assistance there. But you just make sure that you download the form onto your computer. Um, if you have not completed a human subjects protection section before, I cannot stress this enough, or if you haven't done it in a while, I really recommend, again, looking at the NIH instructions. They really go step by step and tell you which sections you should complete because it depends on your project. And I will say the human subjects protection format and process is probably, in my opinion, compared to the other NIH requirements uh, for grants has changed the most over time. Not necessarily the information collected, some of it has, but just the format that NIH require has, has changed over time. And it could change again. So when you download the human subjects and clinical trials information form, and I will say the name can kind of throw people off sometimes. They say, oh, well, my project is not a clinical trial, so I don't have to complete this form. That's not right. If it's human subjects research and your IRB uh, has reviewed it as such, this is the form you have to complete. Uh, if your project is specifically a clinical trial, there are additional uh, it, there are additional sections of the form that are pertaining to clinical trials, but the the, the human subjects. Um, the way you address human subjects research is in this form. So when you download um, the human subjects form, the first page should look like this. Um, now this is the part, this is the part of your project that is the required documentation that helps ensure the research involving human subjects meets the guidelines. This is your um, this is your document that proves um, that you are 
you your research is are following the guidelines and that it does involve human subjects. Um, on this particular form, it's some most of this is, is self-explanatory, but I'm going to go through a few parts of it. Um, this particular box is um, important. This is where you will check yes or no um, if your project involves human subjects. Like I said, for the Community Scholars Program, I'm assuming majority of these projects will be yes. Um, the human, and it asks it ask below if there are exemptions. Um, human subject exemptions, I believe NIH has exemptions from number one through number five or six. I can't remember exact numbers. Um, this is determined at the time of your IRB approval. And if you have an exemption, it should be noted on your IRB approval memo, which exemption that your study falls under. Um, and it also should be noted on your IRB approval if it is a clinical trial or not. Um, your IRB approval, your actual memo that states your project is approved, the date of approval, and the date of expiration does go to NIH. And so they look at that and make sure, they use that to make sure that you've addressed all the appropriate sections. Once you fill out that box um, that I have noted at the top, this particular button becomes clickable. Okay, before you fill out the top box, it's grayed out. You won't be able to click on this. So the, once you fill out that it is human subjects, then this button becomes usable. And it's going to download what's called the study record. This is the meat and potatoes of, hum, of your human subjects information. Um, it's going to uh, ask you all the questions and all the sections, et cetera, for human subjects. But this, you have to download this form as well. So clicking on it would open up the form. And again, you download the form that is opened up to your computer. Okay, this is um, a picture of what this, the study record or the first page of the study record um, form looks like. Um, for today's purposes, we're going to go through this form um, and complete the sections if you just had a standard human subjects research project. So just note if, you're, if your project is a clinical trial or has human subject exemption, um, this form and the parts of it that you're required to complete uh, may be different. So I'm just going to give you an example if you just have a human subjects um, a project um, that has been IRB approved with no exemptions and it's not a clinical trial. Uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough about following the NIH instructions for this page. Um, it uh, I often find um, the most common mistakes I, I see with this information is either the investigator does too much they fill out too many sections or they don't address every required section. So if you follow the instructions step by step, that should really help you in determining which sections you have to address uh, for this form. So with that said, we'll kind of briefly go over the form. Uh, the first part is the study title. Uh, you need to make sure that your study title, title listed matches your study title on your IRB approval. Um, this is a requirement for, for NIH. Um, it, and then it'll go through some of the similar questions on the prior page. It'll ask you if your project is exempt from federal regulations. Um, it'll ask you uh, the clinical trial questionnaire. So this is where, uh, this is the NIH definition of a clinical trial. If you were to answer yes to all of these questions, then it is considered an NIH clinical trial. I will say that if you received your IRB approval and it, it is not a clinical trial, it's not listed on your IRB approval as a clinical trial, and you check yes to all of these, you should go back to your IRB and discuss it with them. Um, you're going to enter in, in section 2.1, the condition or focus of your study. For example, if you're studying obesity or if you're studying diabetes or cancer, anything, the, the condition or focus of your study should be listed here. 
The eligibility criteria, this is usually your inclusion criteria. So the, um, the, the, the individual and their characteristics, et cetera, that you're looking for for this project would go here. Um, the bottom half of the form, as you see, is a mix of drop downs and a mix of um, attachment uploads. So uh, you're going to enter in all of these sections if you have a human subjects research study with no exemptions. All of these sections are required for you to address. Please do not skip them. If you're not sure, please ask uh, your contact at a community scholar program. Um, and they can get in touch with me if needed. But, um, but for a standard human subjects research study, all of these sections are required for you to address. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's items such as the age limit you're looking for, inclusion of individuals across the lifespan, inclusion of women and minorities, with your recruitment and retention plan. Um, the drop down is recruitment status. So if you're um, not recruiting, if you're recruiting, if you're um, completed recruiting, that those are the types of um, of those are the types of choices for recruitment status. And you'll have to address the study timeline and enrollment of first participant. So the, when you fill out this particular section for the first time, you'll need to put in a date but the drop down choices are anticipated or actual. So if, you're, if your study hasn't started yet, then you'll put the date best of your ability when you would like to start your study and it would be marked anticipated. Um, now, as you see the, the ones such as inclusions across the lifespan, that is an uploadable section. So each of these sections, again, following the NIH instructions as far as what you should write for each of these sections are separate attachments. So you will need to separate them out on your computer in a PDF version and upload them individually to your form. So I would recommend um, having all of your human subjects information in one central place on your computer so you can easily upload the different documents um, to this form. Okay. Moving on to the bottom. This is uh, where it will expand out when you click on it to add your inclusion enrollment report. And I'm gonna show you what that particular report looks like. So you click that, the, this inclusion enrollment report expands out as part of the um, as part of the, the overall form. So again, it's going to ask you on this information and this form the um, report title. It, again, it should match your IRB title um, for your project. You'll complete all the then answer all the necessary forms. I mean, I'm sorry, necessary sections of this form. Um, and then the bottom part of it is your planned enrollment. So where your target, your target of, of ethnic, um, ethnic and gender categories will go here. Um, and I will tell you at the bottom of the form, it does calculate the number for you. You don't have to do that. Um, and I, this is what it looks like at the planned stage. So one thing that has changed recent in the last couple years with NIH is when we come back to um, to get updates on your project at for your reoccurring progress reports and that sort of thing, we have to update these numbers and report them to NIH at least yearly. And for this particular um, this particular information, the format for the actual participants that you enroll looks will look different than this. It's now required in an Excel CSV file format. So at the time of your progress report, at least yearly, we'll provide you with a template to put your actual numbers in. So just wanted to make that clear. This is different if you submitted to NIH before and familiar with this form. It used to have a cumulative table that looked similar to this that would be updated. And now it has to be in this Excel format 
that is uploaded to the NIH system. So it's just gonna look a little bit different than this. Okay, going back to the form and what's required if you have a human subjects um, study with no exemptions and not a clinical trial, uh, you have to complete the protection of human subjects section. That is a separate section, just like the ones on the previous page, such as inclusion of women and minorities, et cetera. It's a separate document. Um, I would say um, for this particular section, um, again, please read the NIH instructions carefully. There are several sections required as part of this. So it's not just a paragraph. There are separate sections that you need to address as part of the overall protection of human subjects. So just make sure you take a look at that. Um, this is where you'll check yes or no if you have a multi-site study. If you will be using a data SATA monitoring board, uh, for the most part, routine human subjects research studies, this is not a requirement. But sometimes in certain cases, in certain studies, maybe a, a DSMB will be used. If so, this is where you would indicate that. But for the most part, um, it is not required uh, as part of a routine human subject protection section. So if it's not, then you would click no here. Now the rest of the form, starting with, oops, let me get back, st starting with the study team um, and beyond are required for clinical trials. So if your study is not a clinical trial, the rest of the form is not applicable to you. You can leave it blank. Um, couple of, um, of other, a little bit more information. Um, make sure again, I mentioned it before, all your documents are in a PDF format. So when you upload them, please don't upload a Word document. Um, it will send an error in the system. So if you could please make sure that your documents are in a PDF form. And, I, I, and we talked about this on the last slide, but I'll reiterate again, at least annually as part of your progress report uh, that we, actually submit to NIH on a yearly basis, uh, we will need updates on enrollment numbers, enrollment status, and your date of first enrolled. So once you complete this form, you don't have to usually complete it all again. It's just updating the particular section such as enrollment numbers and that sort of thing, unless your study changes. If something changes in any of the sections that are required, then uh, we would have to send those particular sections to NIH. But for the most part, we're gonna be asking you um, at least annually for an update on enrollment numbers, enrollment status, and um, the date of your first um, participant you enrolled. Because of the formatting involved in the, um, in the clinical human subjects and clinical trials information form, this particular form can be a separate attachment from the rest of your um, of your um, your research strategy sections. So the rest of the sections should be sent in a single PDF. But this particular form um, can be problematic trying to merge it in with the uh, with the other PDF form. So it can be submitted as a separate form or a separate attachment, I should say. So I just wanna give you an example, a snapshot of a um, completed human subjects and human subjects and clinical trials information form, um, specifically the study record part. This is an actual trial that um, was completed and was approved by NIH. And this is an example of what it would look like when you're finished with that form. First page, second page, and the last section you would um, complete. And as you can see, when we get down to section three, um, it human the protection of human subjects attachment is here. They answered the question if it's a multi-site study. They answered the question about the data safety monitoring board, and that is all the information that is required. Everything else beyond this point is not required unless you have a clinical unless your unless your study is a clinical trial. This is an example of a completed inclusion enrollment form. 
they completed the title, they answered the questions. Um, this particular project has some comments um, about the project. It, 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 really, it really just depends on your project. Uh, comments are not required on this form. But if there's something else that you think that NIH needs to know related to the enrollment numbers, you can put that information here. Like I said, it's not required. And then this is an example of what their plan numbers look like on this particular project. Okay, and last but not least, we're going to go through uh, the NIH bio sketch or biographical sketch that is required. Again, this form is on the web page of the PHS 398 template um, with all the templates on it. This particular template does get updated more regularly. So you do need to make sure that you are using the most up-to-date template that is on the website for your biographical sketch. Um, so what is an NIH bio sketch? Um, it, is, it is used to document the qualifications and experience for each of the proposed senior and key personnel and other significant contributors on the grant. There are different templates um, depending on um, your, your level. So there's ones for fellowships such as postdocs and pre-doctoral students. Um, there's also, and there's also a different one for non-fellowships, which is basically any other type of award. There is, uh, NIH does provide uh, in instructions. Again, we kind of went over that. And also they provide samples. So if you've never done one, I would definitely look at one of these samples to see how it was completed. That would help you out a lot. Um, something to note is figures, graphics, or tables are not allowed as part of the bio sketch. So we'll take a look at a bio sketch as far as the beginning on the next slide here. So at the, the top of the bio sketch uh, looks like this. You'll enter your name, your ERA Commons username. We'll come back to that in a minute. Your position title. And then below is where you'll list out your uh, degrees, completion date, and field of study. Uh, beyond that, there are three sections. There are the personal statement section, the physician scientific and honors, and then contributions, contributions to science. So going back up here to the ERA Commons username, if you're not familiar with this. So this is the infrastructure to manage grants awarded by NIH and other agencies. Um, it's, it stands for Electronic Research Administration. So the ERA Commons is the site for interacting between funding agency, grant reviewers, and academic organizations and researchers. Um, your key personnel are required to register for an ERA Common username and include that username on your biographical sketch. Again, if you're unfamiliar and, and not sure how to go about this, contact the uh, your, contact the Community Scholars Program and they can help help you with, with that. Um, something to note too, as far as the education, this is something that uh, NIH has changed. Um, when you list out your education, it, it should be listed out in reverse chronolog chronological order, meaning you're older, the oldest first, and you're more recent at the bottom. Um, I have seen NIH send bios graphical sketches back to us because they were not listed in the correct order. So just make sure that you do that. And that's where the ERA Commons username will go. The personal statement. Uh, what is the personal statement part? Um, it changes with each proposal. So it, it is adapt, it should be adapted and written depending on the project you're, you're applying for funding for. It is a brief half page description of the role of the researcher in the project, what you're going to be doing. It, it should include training applicable to the research, experience, expertise in the methods proposed, any ongoing or completed research related projects, and citations of publications. Um, just note that hyperlinks and URLs are not allowed in the biographical sketch. Um, and across the board, I've found um, now NIH does not um, does not allow URLs and hyperlinks within other sections too. So this one definitely no hyperlinks or URLs um, in the biographical set, um, sketch. And as far as the publications go, a maximum of four, and it should be high. It should highlight the researcher's experience and qualifications to conduct the project. 
positions and honors, the next section. Um, again, you should list in reverse chronological order, the older ones first and your newer ones last. Um, you wanna include any academic, professional, institutional appointments, paid or not, um, and time dedication, full-time, part-time, voluntary, et cetera, there. For community members, high school students and undergrads, uh, you can include any previous positions there. Um, moving on to academic and professional achievements and honors, again, should be listed in reverse chronological orders. Um, students, postdocs, and junior faculty should list scholarships, training, traineeships, fellowships, and development awards. Clinicians can include clinical license and specialty board certifications. And the contributions to science. Here you should briefly describe what the five of the most significant contributions to science. Half a page, including citations. Again, figures, tables, and graphics are not allowed here. Um, each contribution should include a background, a central finding, an influence of the finding, and your role in that work. Um, as said in the beginning, um, NIH does provide a sample of the biosketch, and that link, direct link, is here. Um, it is also on uh, the PHS 398 web, web page as well. As well. Overall, the biosketch may not exceed five pages per person. So just keep that in mind as you're completing your biographical sketch, that it is limited to five pages total. And again, if you have questions or need help on completing a biosketch, contact uh, the Community Scholars Program for assistance. And we'll, um, we'll end there. Um, if you have trouble with especially any of the NIH templates and forms and that sort of thing, um, contact the Community Scholars Program and they can reach me if needed to help you. Also, utilize your grants office. They have helped me tremendously in the past. They, they are very familiar with the NIH guidelines and using templates and what's the most up-to-date. So if you're struggling with that and, um, and, and you need uh, assistance, especially in your own place, um, contact your grants office to see if they can help too. Thanks so much, and we're open for questions. Um, feel free to write them in the chat or unmute your mics and um, speak to us. Thanks so much, I really appreciate it. This is very, very important for all of us. I just have a question or something I would like to clarify. So when we are filling the human protection form, you said that we need to, to have the, the IRB approval before completing the, the form. So should we... Yeah, because sometimes I have seen that the grants do not require you to have the IRB approval when you submit the proposal, but can you clarify? So when you submit for when you submit to the community scholars program for approval, uh, the human subjects and clinical trials information form may or may not be required. Um, for I think they may not be required for your program. So it's when you're you have been selected for awardee and you're working on all your forms that are going to go to NIH for approval. I didn't say this in the beginning. So all of our um, pilot projects that are funded by LACATS federal funds have to go to NIH or our particular program for prior approval before funds can be released and before the project can be can begin. This is part of that process. So the human subjects and clinical trials information form would be in that particular packet where you should have your IRB approval as part of it because it is a requirement. So I would just say that um, I would, wouldn't finalize your human subjects and clinical trials information form until you have your IRB approval memo in hand. Um, you wanna make sure it's approved, make sure if you have any exemptions, it's listed there. Um, if it's a clinical trial, it needs to be listed there, that sort of thing. And it is, uh, we just need your approval memo, the one that states it's approved, the date of approval and the date of expiration. We don't need for NIH approval anyway, uh, for that specifically, we don't need your entire IRB approved protocol or consent forms. 
Now the community scholars program may require you to send that to them, but as far as NIH, they really look at the approval memo. That's what we need. Does that answer your question, Marita? Yes, beautiful, thank you. Okay, so as there are no more questions, we can just uh, finish the webinar. Thanks again so much for your wonderful presentation and clarifications. Sure, thank you for having me. Okay, thank you.